So hi, everybody. I'm Beth Rubay, the host of the Civics Project, and I want to welcome everybody to our episode on the Eighth Amendment. Before we begin today, I'd like to start with a brief land acknowledgement. Repair, the sponsor of the Civics Project, acknowledges the Gabrielina Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin, and South Channel Islands. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Taraha Tum the indigenous peoples in this place. We pay our respects to Hanuk Vatam, the ancestors, Ahihiram, elders, and Iohimkem, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. So as noted, our focus today is on the Eighth Amendment to the US Constitution. So I'm first just gonna read it because it is quite literally a single sentence. The Eighth Amendment says excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. The Eighth Amendment was passed in 1791 as part of the package of the Bill of Rights. So those first 10 amendments. And it, as we just noted, basically includes three components. Bail can't be excessive, fines can't be excessive, and the government cannot inflict cruel and unusual punishment. The cruel and unusual punishment was, lit was lifted verbatim out of the 1689 English Bill of Rights. So we know that that language was essentially just carried over from Britain. And we also know something from the historical record about what the uh, US government, what the individual legislators and Congress were concerned with at the time that this amendment was added to the constitution. They were talking about and fearing the notion that the government would use torture as a tool of oppression. And the Spanish inquisition was raised as an example of where a government might do that. So the language just says cruel and unusual, and it's left up essentially to our federal courts to determine what that means. But, um, the, but we know from the historical record that there was a common public understanding that the concern was that the government should not be allowed to torture people in a way that was basically about oppressing or repressing or taking away rights not a total ban on torture. And that language, cruel and unusual is notable here. It's not apparently sufficient in the text as written that punishment be cruel, right? It has to be, uh, it can't be usual cruelty, it has to be unusual. And again, the historical record tells us a little bit about what was likely intended at the time. Over time, the government and the state have had varied and conflicting understandings about what does that mean. Again, the word torture is not explicitly indicated, but it's one of the things that comes up in the interpretation of cruel and unusual. The excessive bail and excessive fines um, prongs of the Eighth Amendment have also been litigated at various points, but they have never been quite as controversial or contentious. So just as one example, though, there was a case um, in Ohio, which involved uh, recently the owner of a brothel. And uh, the state court said a bail for her of $1 billion, billion with a B as in boy, not M as in mice, right? So a billion dollar bail. And it, I don't believe was challenged in the federal courts, but one of the reasons that the state courts seemed to find that that was reasonable, despite the fact that there was no allegation that the brothel keeper Freeman was, um, was a flight, was, I'm sorry, was a, a dangerous risk to the public. There'd been no history of physical violence. Um, basically the prosecution indicated a high likelihood that she would flee and the court agreed to a billion dollar bail. So it's difficult to imagine a scenario in which um, 
you would understand a billion dollars not being excessive, but it might be comprehensible if we think about it in terms of, is it excessive relative to the risks if a person essentially skips bail or jumps bail? Um, however, as noted, the cruel and unusual prong of the Eighth Amendment has been the one that's generally been the most controversial and the most contested. To get a sense of what it's meant, um, would take a bit more time than we really have because the history of litigation and enforcement and interpretation of cruel and unusual punishment really takes us into the deeper history of incarceration in the United States, which is generally where punishment as it's interpreted in the Eighth Amendment is, is, is occurring. But I'm gonna talk about some of the federal court decisions, mostly at the level of the Supreme Court in the last 50 years. And I think that that may give us a sense of sort of what kinds of questions has our legal system had to de decide over time. So I'll start in 1972 uh, with a case called Furman versus Georgia. And this involved a burglar, William Henry Furman, and he was given the death penalty and he had killed somebody. So it was definitely a violent crime, but it was during an attempted robbery and his allegation at least was that her death was accidental and I believe he had some evidence supporting that claim. He argued successfully basically for the first time that I'm aware of at this level of the court decision, of the, of the, the court structure, meaning at the Supreme Court, that the harsh sentence of death despite the, the lack of homicidal intent uh, was because he was African-American. So in this landmark case, just after the civil rights movement, in a 5-4 decision, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed with Furman, and they changed his sentence from death penalty to life. And again, you know, he was able to submit quite a bit of evidence demonstrating a long-standing pattern of harsher penalties, particularly the death penalty for African-American uh, convicts. In that immediate period in the early 70s, a number of death sentences that were pending at the time in the United States were basically redefined and reduced to life imprisonment. So at, the, at this time period, those state laws eventually got stricter and the federal law continued to evolve. Uh, the Furman versus Georgia case basically redefined how US law views the death penalty. So the unequal applications, ac ac application of the law became part of what the court basically considered as unusual or cruel under the meaning of the Eighth Amendment. In 1976, uh, a case was heard by, again, by the Supreme Court in Estelle versus Gamble, which has become a major precedent in the area of prison law. So this, and this took place in the, U in the Texas prison system in the 1970s. The, um, the appellee, J.W. Gamble, was an incarcerated person. And while working in the prison system, a 600 pound bale of hay fell, fell on him. He suffered a back injury, uh, but he was not diagnosed uh, in the first maybe six months after. And though he was treated, he was not properly treated. And then when he was uh, basically unable to work because of the pain, the prison, uh, the prison staff accused him of refusing to work and punished him by placing him in solitary confinement. So Gamble's claim was this is cruel and unusual, first for not giving me medical care that worked or diagnosing my condition when I'm in a lot of pain for more than six months. And second, for then punishing me further, putting me in solitary confinement, basically for not having adequate medical care. So Gamble's argument was that this was unconstitutional and Gamble lost resoundingly. So the Supreme Court sided with the prison eight to one. Um, and part of their reasoning was that negligence or sort of unintentional or inner, inadvertent failure to provide adequate medical care, medical care is not enough to be cruel and unusual. So you would have to show that the prison was basically intending for him to suffer by denying him decent or adequate medical care, not just being negligent. 
So this was a very important precedent. It basically created a very high bar to hold uh, penal systems accountable for failing to provide you know, functional medical care or for you know, essentially leaving incarcerated people in pain. There was a dissent by Justice Stevens, but all of the other justices seated at the time sided with the Texas prison system. Estelle, representing the Texas prison system, came before the, Kate, the Supreme Court again in 1980, this time as the appellee in Rummel versus Estelle. So in this case, what was at stake was, and Estelle referred basically to the Texas Attorney General or the Director of the Department of Corrections, it was one of those. Um, so Rummel versus Estelle, 1980, after being convicted of three felonies over a period of around 15 years, the appellant, whose name was William James Rummel, got a life prison sentence mandated by a Texas, basically three strikes law. So if you have a third conviction, Texas had a recidivism statute, which gives you a life sentence. The grand total, so his offenses involved uh, basically theft and damage. And the grand total um, dollar amount that was involved in his claims or in his convictions in the 1970 across all three of those claims over 15 years was about $230 in 1970s money. And all of his offenses were nonviolent. So he hadn't hurt anybody. And he basically st stolen or caused damage in amounts of small amounts of money. And this was three felonies over 15 years. So under the strikes, three strikes law, he got a life sentence, despite the very low amount of money at, at stake and the fact that he'd never been convicted for anything violent. The lower courts rejected Rummel's challenge to the sentence. So Rummel argued that having a life sentence for these relatively minor offenses was cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the 18th Amendment. And again, the Supreme Court sided with Texas five to four in a decision authored by Justice William Rehnquist. And they you know, basically gave a lot of deference to the prisons. They said, this is, it's up for Texas to decide you know, what's, what's too much here. And we will allow a life sentence for a very small amount of money to stand. Uh, Justice Rehnquist, uh, authored a majority decision again just a year later in Atia versus Caps. And in this case, it involves state prisoners attempting to challenge pretty severe prison overcrowding, which among other things was resulting in, you know, sort of multiple inmates being um, pressed into small cells that weren't meant to hold many people. So kind of doubling up on selling. So the the lower courts had ordered the state to address the overcrowding, whether through release or through new prison facilities, but basically saying, no, you can't jam people in here this tightly. It's a Eighth Amendment violation. So the Supreme Court disagreed and cited again with Texas saying that prison overcrowding, even if it's pretty severe, is not presumptively a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Uh, Rehnquist wrote, I'm quoting directly, in short, nobody promised them a rose garden, and I know of nothing in the Eighth Amendment, which requires that they be housed in a manner most pleasing to them, or considered even by most knowledgeable penal authorities to be likely to avoid confrontations, psychological depression, and the like. They have been convicted of crime, and there is nothing in the Constitution which forbids their being penalized as a result of that conviction. So Rehnquist's basic standard here, you know, the way that this is written basically says, you know, it's okay if you suffer, right? That's part of the penalty. And um, basically equated the challenge to overcrowding as uh, wanting a rose garden. And also this is very notable in this quotation, right? It says, even if you're crowded up to an extent that people are more likely to fight or attack each other, or become mentally ill, there's no burden on the state not to do that. So that again, established a pretty difficult Supreme Court standard that one would have to argue in order to establish that punishment was cruel and unusual. 
Um, I have a couple other death penalty cases that come up in the 80s that I'd like to talk about, just two. The first was Eddings versus Oklahoma in 1982. And the question at stake is, do courts before sentencing death have to consider mitigating and aggravating circumstances? So mitigating circumstances are those which indicate that perhaps someone's conviction should be a little bit more lenient. Uh, so this extreme circumstances the person is in when they commit a crime. In the Eddings case, what the Supreme Court ultimately held was that when the lower court sentenced Eddings to death and failed to consider his history of basically severe childhood trauma, he'd had a hard life, that the death sentence with no consideration of what his prior life had been was, uh, was basically cruel and unusual. Now it's important to note here that if the trial court had considered that evidence, if it had allowed it and then still decided to sentence him to death, they would be allowed to do that. The Supreme Court wasn't saying you can't give someone the death penalty because they've had a hard life. It was saying that the court must consider that when sentencing, but they can consider that and still sentence death. The reason that the Supreme Court over turned to the lower court in Eddings versus Oklahoma was that the trial court refused to consider that evidence at all. They weren't interested in what Eddings' circumstances had been before he committed a crime which resulted in the sentence of death. So Eddings versus Oklahoma basically established an expectation that at least defense attorneys trying to, put, to argue against a death sentence, whether in an initial sentencing or in an appeal, can ask the court to um, consider mitigating circumstances. What are the circumstances which should be taken into account in sentencing? And that means that there are some anti-death penalty advocates whose work is basically to go and argue mitigation professionally. Why do the circumstances of this person's life indicate that death is not the appropriate sentence? 1986 involved another important decision that's related, and this one was authored by Justice Thurgood Marshall. The case was Ford versus Wainwright, and this established that you may not execute someone. It is cruel and unusual to kill someone, to execute, when that person is legally, by legal standards, insane. So you cannot execute a person who is severely mentally ill, not just a little mentally ill, doesn't mean clinically depressed, severely mentally ill enough, which by a legal standard basically means they don't understand either what they did or that it was wrong or what's going on at all, right? So the Ford versus Wainwright um, decision basically created an exemption to the death penalty in 1986 for people who are so basically extremely insane because the legal standard is quite high. Farmer versus Brennan was another landmark case in 1994. And frankly, it's sad that we had to wait for 1994 for this case. The Farmer versus Brennan decision established at the level again of the Supreme Court that rape cannot be understood as part of the punishment. So being sexually assaulted in prison is not part of the penalty that's allowable against incarcerated people. Now, this is important to understand because we have to consider the prior history, for instance, in Atiyah versus Caps, in which the court said, yeah, it's not cruel and unusual to like jam people tightly into cells like little tuna fish or sardines, right? So we already know that a certain amount of misery is allowable without meeting the Eighth Amendment standard of being cruel and unusual. But the Farmer versus Brennan case says, whatever is allowable, whatever ways people are allowed to suffer when incarcerated, we're gonna say sexual assault is not one of those ways. This was, while there were some lower court decisions which were in sync with this, this was the first time at the level of the Supreme Court, 1994, that it was made abundantly clear that if you rape someone in prison and the prison is culpable, then that's an Eighth Amendment violation. 
the prison could be culpable two ways, right? One, it could just be a guard or staff member who's committing the assault. But the Farmer versus Brennan case went further and also said, you know, if the officials know what's happening, enable it, don't care, deliberately look the other way, they're also culpable for that. So it established a failure to protect standard and basically put prisons on notice that if they were allowing sexual assault to be kind of a rampant problem between incarcerated people, not just by their own staff, that they could be culpable. It's also notable, right, the doctrine established in Farmer versus Brennan applies across now, you know, basically relevant cases under the Eighth Amendment. But it's also notable that this case involved a transgender incarcerated person. So I would say that this case was also somewhat of a victory for LGBTQ rights because it defended the rights of, you know, basically an extremely stigmatized person, a transgender incarcerated person in this context. Um, I next want to just mention one more death penalty case that's recent. And that uh, arose in 2010. And the case name is Graham versus Florida. And this again went before the Supreme Court and it involved a teenager with two incidences of robbery. There was no evidence of a homicidal event, offense, right? The teenager hadn't killed anybody. The first incident was when they were 16. The second was after they released about six months later. And the Florida courts sentenced Graham to life sentence without parole and did this again for crimes that had been committed before the age of 18 and which did not result in death. So the court was basically uh, posed this question. Does the imposition of a life sentence without parole on a juvenile convicted of a non-homicidal offense violate the Eighth Amendment's prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment? And this went for Graham. So six to three, the Supreme Court ruled against the state of Florida and said, okay, you know, unlike the earlier decision in uh, basically uh, Rummel versus Estelle in 1980, where the court had said, you know, we're going to leave this up to Texas. We're going to let the state decide, you know, what's too much punishment. So they allowed it to stand that someone got a life sentence for basically, uh, you know, property losses, a little over $200 with no violence. Here, what they said is, you know what, we're going to put some limits. You can't just lock up a kid forever when they haven't tried to kill anybody. And so it uh, sort of pushed the cruel and unusual standard back in the direction of less excessive penalties in some limited circumstances. So that again was 2010, the Graham versus Florida decision. The last thing that I wanna particularly introduce besides this little review of some of the relevant case law is to talk about sort of usual cruelty. So aside from what our own courts say and what advocates out in our communities, advocacy groups, NG, non-governmental organizations, grassroots and nonprofit organizations say, one of the only ways that there's sort of a formal evaluation of the US carceral system, meaning prisons, jails, and detention facilities, as well as juvenile halls and camps is through the United Nations. So the United States, has signed on to the United Nations Convention Against Torture. And for those not familiar, when you are, when any nation is, is presented with a United Nations Human Rights Convention or any other convention coming out of the United Nations, they're not automatically bound by it. Each nation decides whether to agree, right? So a convention is like an agreement, essentially. But the US, through both a signature by the president and ratification by our Congress did sign on to the Convention Against Torture. And that means the United States said, we will follow the you know, prohibitions and requirements indicated in this convention and make sure that our domestic law conforms to it. So the US made this commitment. Now the United Nations can't really do anything other than make a statement. If the, if the US doesn't follow this, it's not like the United States government can be arrested, right, for not following the Convention Against Torture. But the United Nations has a special rapporteur who is responsible 
uh, for at least evaluating and making very public comment, which nations around the world will be aware of, about how each country is complying. And uh, for uh, quite some time now, since the signature of the convention, since the US became a signatory to the Convention Against Torture, the uh, UN Special Rapporteur, who's varied over time, has continued to report out and say, hey, United States, you're violating the CAT, the Convention Against Torture. And I'll read a brief quotation from Nils Meltzer, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture Now and may, as far as I recall, and made this statement in 2020 last year. So Meltzer says, for years, my mandate has raised concerns about the worldwide overuse of solitary confinement, which is subject to widespread arbitrariness. My predecessor, Professor Juan Mendez, has compellingly shown the extent to which such practices could amount to torture. So this is on solitary confinement. And Nils is, re is referencing his predecessor and saying these practices could amount to torture. Then uh, Meltzer turns his attention specifically to the United States. And this is what he says. Quote, most recently, the practices of Connecticut Department of Corrections, the DOC, have been brought to my attention. The DOC appears to routinely resort to repressive measures, such as prolonged or indefinite isolation, excessive use of in-cell restraints, and needlessly intrusive strip searches. There seems to be a state-sanctioned policy aimed at purposefully inflicting severe pain or suffering, physical or mental, which may well amount to torture. So again, we have to remember that our federal courts are not bound by anything coming out of the United Nations. They can listen to it, but they can disagree with the interpretation of the Convention Against Torture. And regardless, their job is to enforce the Eighth Amendment and other US domestic law. But it gives us some way to understand how by external standards, which the United States has agreed to, uh, the United States carceral system, meaning our prison jails and detention facilities and youth facilities are measuring up. So I wanna recommend uh, some reading for those who are interested uh, and particularly wanna suggest the book Live from Death Row by Mumia Abu Jamal. Uh, some of you may know well who he is as a you know, fairly famous a political prisoner. Uh, one of the questions our audience members in the chat are asking is, can I say a little bit more about the history of the Eighth Amendment relative to solitary confinement and what it might take for courts to determine that solitary confinement is cruel and unusual or punishment? Um, so I won't try to get into this in great depth, uh, but yes, we certainly do have a body of law about solitary confinement in the Eighth Amendment. So we know that the United Nations is saying that the U.S. is overusing solitary confinement to a degree that might be um, very problematic. There was, for instance, um, a early 19th century case uh, in Ray Medley. So this was from 1890. And the court had to look at sort of descriptions of extreme harm that the prisoners were, the incarcerated people were experiencing. They described them as um, basically fainting, becoming violently insane, committing suicide. Um, and that even if they did withstand it better than that, they um, often couldn't work and also weren't less likely to commit crimes. So this was sort of like the early courts rec recognizing the question of solitary confinement. And we have both Eighth Amendment history and um, that an example is the Madrid versus Gomez case, which was brought by uh, incarcerated people in California's Bellican Bay, Bay State Prison, um, which included a, a number of violations, including solitary confinement. And they basically said that psychological trauma as it's experienced by the average incarcerated person 
is not itself enough to create an Eighth Amendment violation. So what they did, however, was create an exception for pres prisoners with pre-existing severe mental illness, which would create an unreasonably high risk of suffering if they were subjected to solitary confinement. So we saw the courts basically said, well, in general, we're not gonna say solitary is cruel and unusual, but it might be if somebody's already very vulnerable. So the court factored in mental health illness as part of the test. And then isolation, solitary confinement has also been challenged under the 14th amendment and questions of due process that that's not our primary focus today. So some of those cases are also kind of part of how we see advocacy around solitary confinement. Basically, in and of itself, just showing the use of isolation is likely in most federal courts before most justices or judges to not be sufficient by itself to show Eighth Amendment. The length of time might matter, coupled with other kinds of harms might, might also factor in like solitary confinement in combination with other things might be dispositive. The fact that someone is mentally ill or otherwise needs a lot of extra care because of health limitations can also be factored in. But in and of itself, prolonged use of isolation essentially is currently allowable under our Eighth Amendment doctrine. Thank you for the question. So I wanna invite folks to rejoin us next week for our uh, upcoming episode on same-sex marriage. And so this will be on October 24th usual time, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. And then the following week, October 31st, we're gonna talk about our tax system and taxation, uh, which people often think of as a boring subject, but when we think about our current controversies about, for instance, uh, corporate taxation and, and former President Trump's tax returns, there are actually quite a lot of intriguing and political questions bound up in taxation. So again, same-sex marriage on the 24th, and taxation on the 31st. I hope you'll join us then. Uh, for our Zoom listeners, you'll receive follow-up uh, information, including uh, the link to our events registration page, which you've already received that before. For our podcast listening audience, you can find a link to our events registration page in the podcast description. So you're welcome to join us live anytime. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today.